My grandmother is dying. It's not the death that we had hoped for her, in as much as one hopes for death. She is a wonderful human being and serves as the ultimate matriarch for our extended family with, all, with an all-encompassing and voracious love that extends to everyone she meets. As a child and a young adult, I remember her stories of her younger days. She would reminisce about her strong, able body working the Oklahoma cotton fields with her sisters. I still remember my mother telling me of the many dinners with complete strangers they would have as children, demonstrating my grandmother's unyielding compassion for others. We had very humble beginnings and still this woman would share the little she had. As a child, I remember her amazing clarity of mind and patience in teaching me to crochet and sew. Do not ask me to crochet anymore. <laughs> she had a huge hand in my upbringing, sometimes playing more of a mother role than grandmother. Both of my parents worked, and my sisters and I would spend a great deal of time with my grandmother after school. These memories, her stories, and my undying love for her results in a great deal of pain over her current situation. Pain from now seeing this woman's once strong body reduced to a nursing home bed, her digestive tract too weak to process solid food. Her current temperament, understandably sporadic, masks that once ever-present compassion with fits of frustration for her current situation and a fear of the unknown ahead. The mental clarity that raised me, that brilliance in everyday tasks like sewing and crocheting is gone now, and in its place are episodes of wild fancy sometimes seeing my deceased grandfather and other times seeing imaginary ants scurry across her room. Where is her journey headed? How will she get to those everlasting shores that we sung about? Will I see her again in some other land? In March of this year, my family suffered a huge loss. My uncle had been struggling for years with diabetes. The inability to regulate his sugar had resulted in a considerable number of additional health problems, one of which was congestive heart failure. He suffered a massive heart attack and had to be flown from the small Texas town in which he lived to one of Houston's major cardiac hospitals. I flew in to help my family with support as I was very close to them. Over the week, I was lucky enough to spend quality time with my wonderful aunt, uncle, and cousins before my uncle was, as we say in my family, called home. While sad, this was expected. The immediate prior loss of his wife that same night was a complete shock. While the specifics of these examples might be a little unusual, they are, at their roots, part of life as mortal creatures here on this big blue marble. We are born, we live our lives, we die. My family's immediate and ongoing dealings with dying and death forced us into a bit of an existential crisis, as much as people from Texas can have existential <laughs> crises. What happens, if anything, after death? Is my childhood notion of a heavenly home helpful, or does it do more mental harm to me than good? What do I believe about the afterlife now that I'm a Unitarian Universalist? Are there truths in other faith movements that can help us better understand and cope with the concepts of the hereafter? As a young Baptist, I was always taught that the struggles of this life really weren't that important. If I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, my place in the kingdom to come, also known as heaven, would all be set. Learning about this mystical afterlife took the form of stories. Stories that I must admit I still love to this day. I remember as a child attending vacation Bible school in summer months. There, I would learn a lot about being a good person, heaven and hell, 
and of course, salvation. I would often be quoted the Christian Bible's Gospel of John 14, verse 2, that's chapter 14, verse 2, which quotes Jesus as saying, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. We also had so many hymns about the world to come that spoke of streets paved with pure gold and then the all too familiar pearly gates as we saw in today's uh, multimedia presentation. In researching the sermon and walking back through these memories and the scriptures, I was faced with an interesting discovery. Born and raised in the Baptist faith meant that I had a keen appreciation and understanding that the King James Version of the Christian Bible was really the only one true interpretation. <laughs> However, according to the Reverend Dr. Gene Wilder of the First Baptist Church in Jefferson, Tennessee, the King James Version of this scripture verse incorrectly translated the Greek word for a, a dobe, oh, abode, adobe, sorry, abode, <laughs> or room, to the word mansion. Imagine that my surprise, discovering that God doesn't have lots of individual mansions for me <laughs> upon death, but rather simply just has one very large house with lots of rooms for each individual. My mind has always been prepared to share an eternity in my own personal mansion, with only those people I wanted. <laughs> the realization that I may have gotten it wrong and that there is instead the potential of sharing a single eternal home with all of my friends and family without discretion is mm, sombering. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Wilder goes on to state that the pearly gates and streets of gold are quotes from the op apocalyptic writing of Revelation, and most scholars would agree that this book, as is all apocalyptic writing, should all only be seen as symbols and rarely interpreted literally. It's at this point that my writing stops and my internal dialogue goes a bit crazy. What? No pearly gates, only one big mansion, this cannot be right. Maybe I should just go back to the thought of being sent to hell for my homosexuality. Perhaps Satan can get me my own mansion. <laughs> he may have a better realtor than God. <laughs> Maybe. I'm just saying. All, all kidding aside, I do... I do sometimes find my u new Unitarian Universalism lacking on the blind hope and faith of my past religious upbringing. You see, when times get tough, my spirit is down, when I look around and sometimes wonder what is this all about, my focus on the beautiful streets of gold, the pearly gates, or reunions with prior lost family members in a large mansion always gave me hope courage, and conviction to continue my journey. Now I find myself the shell of a jaded, bitter Baptist, <laughs> shunning myself for ever believing such wild fits of fantasy. My UU beliefs in the afterlife are murky at best, and are seemingly no longer a crutch to get me through the hard times. At this point, some of you may be listening giving me some time to redeem the rather depressing sermon. Others of you may be thinking to yourself, boy, they let anyone speak from the pulpit in the summertime. <laughs> in, in any case, I really hope you stick with me. I promise I will try to end on a high note. <laughs> you see, I, I do like to call myself a born-again Unitarian Universalist. I love reclaiming overtly right-wing religious terminology and re repurposing it to drive conversation and discussion. My born-again UUism allows me to remind myself that our faith movement is actually full of hope for the future. That elusive feeling that I want to anchor my sadness against, my beliefs in UUism 
can give me that strength that I need. In writing this sermon, I began to wonder what the other major world religions thought of death and the afterlife. How similar or how disparate are they? The fact that my faith movement insists that I pull from more than just my background means that I have a rich opportunity to search for truth that speaks to my soul. We have already seen the biblical underpinnings of our Christian ancestors' conceptualizations of heaven. My readings led me to the second largest world religion of Islam. I was actually astonished at how similar the Islamic and Christian apocalyptic representations of the end times were. According to Imam Kamil Mufti, one of the few American Muslim scholars who is accredited with successfully combining Western scientific education and traditional training in sacred law, quote, there is a direct relation between conduct on earth and the life beyond. The afterlife will be one of rewards and punishments, which is commensurate, commensurate with earthly conduct, end quote. In general, what I found was that in Islam contends that death brings with it a slumber. While in the sleep of death, an individual will be treated according to their deeds in this worldly life. This is where we remain, awaiting the great day of reckoning, when the dead will be resurrected by God, who will then issue final judgment on his people very similar to the book of Revelation in Christianity. I also found many interesting articles and texts on the diversity of what we here in the West call Hinduism, the third largest of the world religions. There are actually many varied types of Hinduism. To me, insisting that there's only one flavor of Hinduism is more like thinking Catholicism is the same thing as being a Baptist. Christianity is diverse in their representation of sectional beliefs, just as Hinduism is. However, some core beliefs are shared across the diverse tapestry. In Hinduism, generally speaking, there is not an actual heaven, but rather our soul is reincarnated over time in a cycle of rebirth called samsara. The deeds we do in this plane of existence referred to as dharma, work to balance our past lives' misdeeds and our present life good deeds until our cosmic karma scorecard is great enough to allow us to break from the samsara circle in what is called moksha. After one breaks from this cycle, many sects of Hinduism believe the eternal soul does reconnect to the supreme and obtains and attains oneness, a reconnection to the divine or Brahman. Buddhism, the fourth greatest world religion, shares very similar beliefs in the afterlife with its parent religion, Hinduism. However, there is a major and interesting difference between these related religious thoughts. In Buddhism, there is no concept of an individual eternal soul. According to the vener ver venerable K. Sri Damananda Mahathira of the State University of New York at Stony Brook, there is a parable, quote, there is a parable in Buddhist texts with regard to the belief of an eternal soul. A man who mistook a moving rope for a snake became terrified by that fear in his mind. Upon discovery that it was really only a piece of rope, his fear subsided and his mind became peaceful. The belief in an eternal soul is equated to the rope of that man's imagination." End quote. To me, here, that teacher is trying to explain that the belief of an eternal soul, or Atman in Hindi, is a distraction from the important work of calming the mind and working what Buddhists call the Eightfold Path. Fixation on the soul force or its existence or not in, the same, in some afterlife only distracts a person from the work required to be done on this plane. Part of the Eightfold Path is a deep belief in right actions, right livelihood, and right efforts here in this world, with no limited anticipation 
of the hereafter. It would also be a mistake for me not to include Judaism in our discussion, as it is one of the principal foundations of our faith movement. Looking into the Judaic myths of the afterlife, we can see a varied belief system. Rabbi Or N. Rose is associate dean of the Rabbinical School of, of Hebrew College in Newton, Massachusetts. He recently published an article, Heaven and Hell in the Jewish Tradition. He indicates that as with most of these end of life myths from the other faith movements, the reading should be taken with a grain of salt. He points out, for example, that there are varied words for the hereafter in Hebrew. Olam haba refers to a heaven-like afterlife that should be manifest eventually on earth after the messianic era is reached. But other writings refer to a gan idan, similar to the original Garden of Eden prior to humanity's fall from grace. In any case, Rabbi Rose acknowledges that most modern Jewish followers would today choose to focus on the biblical model of Judaism, which hones its practitioners on improving the life of all on this plane of existence through the mitzvah of tikkun alam, or healing the world, a deep mystical belief that our actions and treatment of each other in this life can hinder or aid in the realization of the messianic era, a return of the kingdom of God here on earth through our actions and intentions. So here we are, a bunch of very different stories of the end times and afterlife. Frankly, I find the diversity of the stories confusing and frustrating. Which should I believe? Do any of them really give me any hope or comfort that I find myself missing now? I think that these are probably natural questions one asks after receiving all of this disparate information. However, like most things in our lives, it is much easier to compartmentalize differences instead of identifying similarities. If we take a step back and look at these stories told today, I think we can start to see a commonality to them all. In Islam, we learn that since our treatment while in the slumber of the grave would be commensurate with our works performed in this life, there is definitely an emphasis on our earthbound actions, or in Arabic, hasana. I find this amaz an amazing similarity to our universalist heritage of recognizing heaven on earth by manifesting divine love through our own actions and treatments of one another in the now. This focus on the importance of our actions in the now is also visible in Hinduism and Buddhism. Hinduism has that systemic, clear interweaving of our actions or dharma and the results of those actions on our karma scorecard, driving our ability to break through the cycle of rebirth and death resulting in a great awakening and or reconnection to nothing and everything simultaneously. Hearing this out loud may seem a bit overwhelming. However, I think in its very reductive forms, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism actually agree that it's not so much about the hereafter, it's about the now. How are we living now? How do we treat one another now? This emphasis on the current world and our interaction with each other while here is further seen in the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, or healing the world. The belief that it is our divine mandate or mitzvah to aid in the betterment of this world through our thoughts, words, and actions. Only our direct actions to one another will ever bring about heaven on earth. It seems to me that all of these world religions in this reductive form have a common truth. Now we come full circle to my, me and my family's existential crises. I don't think that any of my research helped me clarify what happens, if anything, after death. This investigation instead points my mind from the worrying of an afterlife 
to the focus on the present and my behavior toward myself and my greater world. But what do I do about my fits of despair and sadness? If I can't find, if I can't hope any longer for pearly gates or mansions, what is going to keep me going through the tough times? For me, this is where universalist, the, the universalist belief that I directly impact the world around me as a channel of divine love or inspiration lifts me out of despair and frustration and renews in me a sense of hope in the now rather than the great unknown. Could it be that my new eternity is now? One of our forefathers, Reverend John Murray, considered to be the father of American universalism, is quoted as saying, give the people blanketed with a decaying and crumbling Calvinism something of your new vision. Do not push them deeper into their theological despair, but preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. To me, this religious belief focuses the practitioner on the now, fo forcing each of us to contemplate every physical engagement as a spiritual one that will either aid or harm the manifestation of the divine here and now. I do continue to reconcile my original childhood thoughts that my place in heaven is tied only to my salvation and not to my actions. This lack of emphasis on the now in my original Christian understanding of Jesus' teachings now to me seems contrary. I think most would agree that Jesus was ever present in the now and would likely expect us to do the same. We see this in his healing of the sick and treating all people, no matter their walk of life, with dignity and love. When I now find myself focusing on the afterlife and those pains of worry start to creep in of whether I am good enough or whether I will see my loved ones again, I will try to remember the banana tree from today's story. I pray that my life will somehow bring life anew to one or more other people. Have my deeds honored the teachings of my family and friends who wish me to be the best person I can be? Have I left this plane of existence even a little better than I found it? These are now my existential questions. I no longer care so much what is over the rainbow. I would instead much rather enjoy and contribute to the beautiful view the rainbow brings. Perhaps, in summary, my born-again UU faith perception of heaven is best summarized by the African-American 20th century poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who in his poem entitled Religion says, I am no priest of crooks nor creeds, for human wants and human needs are more to me than prophet's deeds. And human tears and human cares affect me more than human prayers. Go cease your well, lugubrious saint. You fret high heaven with your plaint. Is this the Christian's joy you paint? Is this the Christian's boasted bliss? Avails your faith no more than this? Take up your arms, come out with me. Let heaven alone. Humanity needs more and heaven less from thee. With pity for mankind, look around. Help them to rise, and heaven is found. <laughs>